Good day, Donald. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Yeah, no problem, Guy. It's a pleasure as always. <laughs> thank you. So we are here today to talk about your latest book, Learning Experience Design. Before we dive into the book itself, can you give a little background to our audience about you in the learning and development world? Sure thing, guys. So, you know, I'm obviously not a young man. <laughs> and this, so my, you know, my history in this, in this business goes way back to the early 1980s, really, when I bought a home computer. I'd actually picked up some skills in your fine country in America because I went to college there at Dartmouth and had some access to a mainframe and so on. Let's forget all about all that, you know, but that's where I really, that was really the inspiration for this. Came back to the UK and then bought one of these home computers, like loads of people my age. And then the first thing I did was build a program on how to teach Russian, because uh, I was going off to the Soviet, what was the Soviet Union? I traveled quite a lot there. And I did a Cyrillic alphabet thing, you know, with, like drill and practice and then some vocabulary things. And it was really, it really did work. You know, when I went there, uh, you know, I, 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 could, I can still, to this day, uh, you know, I read the Cyrillic alphabet and, you know, I can still speak a bit of Russian. So it did work. I went, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and, you know, so uh, and by accident then, I came down to London and then almost not long after I started the business with two other guys. And that became the one of the very first what are called e-learning companies or multimedia companies back then, as you know. And that that we that we floated that in the stock market, you know, and then I sold it in 2005. And then I've been involved in the business, that business end of this, delivering it to real big clients, you know, like yourself. And it's a salutary thing there. It's one thing writing about design and doing design. It's another thing doing it for real. And so really what the wellspring for this book was, listen, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, this is like nearly 40 years. And, and then COVID comes along. And suddenly you've got almost a doubling or tripling of the number of people who have to do this. And I think the, you know, the, the of course we've got, you, you, we'll, we'll have tens of, you know, thousands and thousands of new people coming in, but many of them don't know that there's a big long history to this and that it's not freshly baked bread. We actually learn a lot about how not to do this and what good practice was. And I'm not saying that all, everything I say is right, because I say in the book, listen, the, you know, there, these are rules, but a lot of them are sort of rules of thumb. But we did, you know, people have been around a bit and have been doing this for a long time. And it's, it's important that we don't forget and dump that stuff. And so learning experience design, LXP, and LA, learning experience platforms were coming along. And I was heavily involved in building one of those, a learning experience platform. Uh, you know, I've been in, in a company and um, we just sold it for $150 million, all that stuff. But it's important to, in a sense, the, a, a good phrase here is learning is a process, not an event. And the big danger for me here is like a big stop sign. I said, hold on. If you're just going to do these experiences and you think that learning is just a single event, like a Disney ride, you're making a big mistake. Because everything that anybody of our age will tell you is that's not true. <laughs> that it's an ongoing process and you have to be very careful about the design of this stuff because it's easy to make wrong assumptions. I hope that was a reasonable wellspring story, you know, that, where it came from. Yes, no, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, it is a fabulous book. I really, really enjoyed it. I kind of read it cover to cover or, you know, on my Kindle, whatever the equivalent of that is. But I wanted to also bring up this series that you're doing with John Helmer, a podcast series, Great Minds on Learning. Could you just tell us a little bit about that series uh, for our audience before we dive into the book? Sure thing, guys. So g going back again over this 40 years, when I first came into this industry, I didn't know anything about it. Right? And uh, But I was also amazed to find that not many other people knew about it. So, you know, like, yeah, I was constantly in meetings with people and I was going, this is weird. It's like being in a, a room with engineers and nobody discusses physics, you know, but they're building bridges. And so originally from day one, I started doing the reading and taking notes, you know, about learning theory, really, and built the company. And so all, everything I've ever been involved in in building real product or client has been built on learning theory. I don't like, you know, which is why I'm really, you know, I just like, somebody should take a big broom and sweep all this sort of stuff mythology out of this industry. But it's still there. You know, Myers-Briggs is still there. Learning styles is still there. It's all still around. Same stuff 40 years ago. Anyway, this learning series, I'd been taking notes for like a lot, many years, and I had used it for internal training. And I had got up to about 50 and then I blogged those 50 people, key learning theories. And then I said, well, God, there's a lot more here. And I kept on going. And it became a bit of a rod from my own back, actually. I got up to 100. 
And then eventually I got up to about 150 and people were quite complimentary and they used them a lot. I said, oh, this is interesting, but you know, blogs and individual learning theories is not enough. People, then the podcast came along and I, I, you know, you know, well, you do it, you know, you, you know how powerful this can be. So I clustered them like cognitivists, behaviorists, you know, there's uh, about 25 clusters here. And then a guy called John Helmer, a sort of, you know, in, a, who used to work for me. And so I know John really well. He's a good friend of mine. We did uh, a series of six, which was things like behaviorists, cognitivists, uh, people like William James, you know, the pregnant pragmatism practice. And we just finished one on assessment. That's everything from Galton and all the IQ, iSync, Myers-Briggs, multiple intelligences and so on. And they're about an hour long, but they try to, get, you know, give a human, put a human face on all this theory. And, and I think people have liked it because, you know, people are doing it when they're out walking the dog or, you know, and it's a good way of digesting the information without having to go back and read all those books. You know, <laughs> you know that's 40 years of reading, really, but I'm trying to condense it. But, and people like myself, and I know you do this really well as well, guys. You know, you, you want, we're older people, we, you, want to bridge into the, you want to bridge that knowledge into, and share it with other people, I think. So that's what that's about, really. I've really enjoyed doing them and... Uh, yeah, I think the podcasts are really, I mean, it came from nowhere, the podcast, isn't it? But everybody's doing it. It's great. Well, and I think that it, that's true because <laughs> you're, bridging, you're, you're creating this bridge between people new to the field coming in and anchoring them in, you know, the theories, the, the miscues that we've had, the, the people that have been proven right, the people that have been proven wrong, Um and I think that they, they need that kind of guidance. They need that kind of help because there is so many, thi so many things out there that do need to be swept away. But I've been hearing about this need for the big sweep uh, since I got into the business here in the late 70s and throughout the 80s. And I don't think it's going to happen. But, you know, try we must, I guess, you know. Um, but anyway, all right. So let's shift gears here now into the book. And before we walk through the book chapter by chapter, I have a three-part question here to start us off on. And then, you know, so who did you write this book for? And then why did you write it? And what do you hope the takeaways are for the reader? Okay, well, I mean, it's important to realize that the book isn't written for experts because people who know this stuff, you know, I'm not going to buy a book about it because they know it like yourself. It's, you're not my typical target audience because you've been around and you probably, I know you've read this book and liked it, but you probably knew a lot of it anyway. So that, that would be my assumption. It's really, it was really written for this fresh audience, you know, and there was all the people who are coming into this. And this is a broad sweep. So you can focus on the learning experience designers, but what is that? Are they instructional designers, learning engineers? I even go into the, don't worry about all the, you know, arose by any other. And don't worry about the nomenclature here. This is a, a sort of role. And it differs from place to place. Some people do more or less depending on the size of the team and so on. So I got that out at the beginning of the book in many ways, but it's written really, I suppose my ideal persona was somebody who's new to this, uh, who's sitting there with a blank sheet of paper, not quite sure what good and, practice, good and bad practice was. So all the chapters are, are very, you know, like do, practical. Do's and don'ts, you know, every single chapter of a list of do's and don'ts. Some of them might be wrong, uh, but I've tried to make them as research-based as possible. Uh, so it's not Donald speaking, you know, it's this is what generally we found works or what the research says is good practice. And then another, th another interesting thing was because there's this new phrase, learning experience design, I also wanted to sort of just hold people off at the pass a little bit here saying, slow down. Think about upfront analysis a wee bit more. Don't ditch 40 years of practice here and just jump into creating these experiences. The word experience could be a bit misleading, you know? All experience is a learning experience, but some experiences are better than others. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, don't rush at that. And don't imagine that you have all the answers to this because it, there are many, many questions surrounding it. So I'd like to unpack the complexity of it. Yes. Well, thank you for that, because I think that's very true. The new people do need this. They need that kind of guidance. And the whole question that's been buzzing around here for a number of years now is, is this different? Um, it's new language, but is it really just a new label for something that's old and true? But I think that that, that kind of dismisses the fact that there are so there's so much variation in people's practices for what could be called instructional systems design or instructional design, et cetera, that 
you know, that, that you can't say <laughs> what those old versions are versus this new one here. But what I liked about the book is that I think it provides very good guidance to people to produce things that are going to have a, a measurable impact, measurable results. Yeah. So we can get away from measuring uh, learning activities and yeah. measure the results of learning. But so let's, let's begin here by walking through the book here. So chapter one, learning experience design. What are you, what are you doing in that first chapter? Yeah, well, really, you know, this is a question, what is it? And, uh, of course, it, it's easy to be glib about this. And you ask the question there, is it new or not? Well, it's not really, <laughs> because learning isn't new. The science of learning, you'll be learning since we, since we were homo habilis, you know, three million years ago. So that, you know, that, that's not new. And we know a lot about learning and the learning side. So if you take those three words, experiences, well, actually, we've been doing learning experience for eons. And certainly using technology, we've been doing it for the 40 years I've been in the business and longer. <clears throat> and then there's the design side. So you really should base everything on learning theory, I think. It's like if you're a physicist and building a bridge, you want to know about physics, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's like any profession, you know, if you want to be a, a doctor, you're going to know about medicine. Uh, but curiously, in the learning world, people assume that you can jump in and be a professional and just almost skip that bit, which I think is wrong. So the, the learning bedrock here, I was really keen that everything was evidence-based. Uh, I was really keen to also, in the book, explain what experiences are, because a premise in the book is learning is a process, not an event. And I really mean that because people forget that actually it's the practice, the embedding of that stuff, transfer, all those old terms that the research have been dealing with. We know a lot about this, but don't ignore it because it matters. And if you think you're just going to put a little like Disney ride experience and it sounds great because you're chasing a Pac-Man around a maze and collecting diamonds and that's going to work, Think again, because it won't. <laughs> the, the, the research screams at you that it's a much longer, more difficult process in learning. And then beyond that, into the design, because we also know a lot about, you know, this is designed for technology-based learning by and large. So we also know a lot about what works and doesn't work there. And the, the general principle in all of this is less is more. I'll repeat that. Less is more. <laughs> There's three, three words you need to know and have, you know, like, above your desk when you're doing this work is that because people you know they, they tend to just load up stuff pad it out and they don't get to the essence which is what the analysis phase is all about about what do they actually need to know here it's a really interesting question but often not asked you know in other words it's all very well having I, you know i'm not a big i'm like i'm a big fan of donald norman's but donald norman keeps saying don't think empathy matters here that doesn't matter at all you know, if you're a 23-year-old designer, you're not going to really have empathy with a, with a, you know, a factory floor worker uh, who's building cars. You're not going to know what that world is. And it's not about empathy. It's about knowing what they do, what their job is, and how you're going to solve the problem when you get stuck or something goes wrong. So Donald Norman always thought empathy was wrong-headed. So some of this book is about just ho holding people at the past and saying, think for a minute about what, what this is all about. Learning, theory experiences, they're maybe not what you think they are, they maybe more complicated to do it well, and of course, good design, learning experience design. Yeah, it was a great start to the book and, uh, you know, being anchored into, you know, what analysis or discovery can tell you is, is the, you know, the terminal performance objective, I think that was good. The next chapter is learning experience designers. So what were you trying to, to address with that? Well, again, following on from that, because the, the, it's always been an area of confusion is what do you call people like us and people who work in this area? I don't think it matters much because language is language, you know, and the, a language is use. So let's not, you know, people say, we well, should call it this, you shouldn't call it. I don't really care. Uh, a language is always fluid in an embryonic field anyway. So one would expect the terms to be all over the place. And I have a list of about a dozen different ways of describing a learning experience designer. And people, you still see those in job ads. What's more important is what they do. So what do you do when you land up in this job? And of course, that's quite diverse as well because it's still finding its feet to this day. Some people, you get more differentiation in labor, I think. When I first started, I did everything. I literally uh, uh, spoke to the client, did all the upfront analysis. I wrote everything. I even coded and programmed it and did all the graphics. <laughs> I did everything. And uh, of course, that's no, hardly ever the case now. Some people still do that. You know, there's a jack of, but you tend to be a jack of, 
all trades master and none. So you've got more differentiation. But people forget that a lot of that job is about liaising with other people, you know, with subject matter experts. How do you handle them? It's a terribly tricky thing. I think it takes 10 years to get that right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because the, if there's one thing that's going to ruin your learning experience, it's the interference from the outside by by uh, a subject matter expert. So if you're shooting a video, for example, my very good friend, uh, Tom Hickmore, he shoots nothing but learning videos. And, he said, and he's a golden rule. He's written a whole book about this. Wrote a very good book called Watch and Learn. He says, you never give a subject matter expert a video script. He said, they will just kill it because they don't really understand what video does. And they'll start adding things that need to be said by the actor because video isn't about telling, it's about showing. <laughs> so... And of course, you learn this stuff over the years. So I was keen to capture that notion of, of what you do. Uh, and also, I think there's a mistake to think that uh, there are big different traditions. Hardly anybody in the UK has gone through a college uh, qualification on this. And I, I'm not too sure that's a bad thing, but I think there's some good things about it as well. But there, there, it tends to be much more common in the US. However, I'm very wary of these degrees now, having seen the curricula. I think they can be quite fossilized. They don't keep up to date with the technology and learning as a process. And therefore I found them quite, you know, quite everybody's in lockstep with quite old stuff in a way. And that's the danger of it being turned into, turned into a sort of a degree in itself. Although I have nothing against that. I think it's probably quite good doing one year or whatever. Uh, but you've got to be careful because for example, being able to write, is a fantastic skill in this field. You're not going to get that by going and doing an instructional design course. You're going to do it by learning how to write. And that's a, that takes a lifetime to do well. So I, I think in that, in that second chapter there, I also look at, uh, this is where it's probably not so relevant for you because you're extremely sophisticated on the, on the process, as it were. But for people coming in, they get these things thrown at them like agile, or the Addy, most people are still doing a sort of Addy waterfall process because it sort of works. And I, I, I really dislike this notion that you just dump the last thing and take on the new. The truth of the matter is that whether it's design thinking, which I'm not a fan of because it's got all these abstract and vague terms like empathy and so on, Donald Norman would hate that stuff and does. Design thinking, Addy and Agile are sort of three archetypes that are around in the world. And, I'm, and uh, you know, my point is, well, it depends really. You know, if sometimes the agile thing, if it's an ill-defined domain or so on, and you can't get a subject matter expert, you might have to go down that route, do loads of iterations and sprint to your finish. But actually most tasks, if they're reasonably well established and so on and defined are better off by having a far more formal upfront process. And I think people will dismiss those traditional processes far too easily in many ways and rush towards whatever's faddish uh, uh, this week uh, on process. So, you know, I really, I, 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 I tackled that head on. Yeah. No, that was good. I especially like your comment. Uh, you know, it's almost that if you deal with a subject matter expert, they think more is more and not more. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're always handling that, I think. And that's, that's just a truism that people need to be prepared for and how to, how to deal with that. Yeah, your, your chapter three is on emotion, attention, and motivation. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, I think again, my, I I really pick up on Donald Norman here because you know you know I'm I, I'm not the expert on that. You know the experts on emotion and learning or you know the theory of learning around motivation we've had like you know like a good well the second half of the 20th century an intense amount of research on that. And I just wanted to lay the groundwork here that. that the emotional component in learning is quite often missed out, but it, I think some of the new learning design stuff has a point here about, you know, that visceral feeling you get. And of course, in my, in my Great Minds of Learning, I, I actually did a whole load of theorists on this area, you know, and there are about half a dozen people who have really looked at the emotional or affective side of learning because all the, all the attention goes to Bloom, but that was just one of three. I mean, people completely misread Bloom. You know, because Bloom came up with tri tripartite distinction, psychomotor, affective, or emotional, and cognitive. But all they do is pick up on the pyramid, which he never had, never was, never did. Completely right. wrong theory. But they pick up on one dimension of learning and forget that actually, when you're actually designing this stuff, the emotional component or affective component is quite important. So I really picked up on Donald Norman's schema, which I think is the best there, which is if you're defining the emotional or affective component, you have to go for this visceral thing, you know, the, 
that, that hit you get when you see something on the screen, the aesthetics, the look and the appearances. And then, of course, there's the behavioural side, the actual performance side, because that's what it's all about. These people actually have to go and do something. And if you miss that out, that's really the necessary condition for success. But very often, if you just concentrate on appearance and things, oh, should it be pink or blue, and miss out the behavioural side, you're way off. And then, of course, there's the reflect the reflective experiential side of all this. And that's around the reason, success, confidence, and all that sort of stuff as well. You know, what, what measures make the, the behavioral traits work in practice? Like, have you thought about how this is going to transfer to the real world? Have you really thought about that? You know, have you got, when they go into the workplace, is the, are they organize, is the organizational context right for that? Uh, is the training, does it encourage the transfer of learning? Or have you motivated people to even think about that issue? People don't. You know, and just creating these entertaining experiences, which are sort of, as I say, in one eye and out the other. <laughs> so I tackle that at the beginning here because that's a, a whole other theory around motivation and attention. Attention is fun. You know, nobody learns anything without attention, but we know a lot about attention from William James onwards. And over arousal is a bad thing. This is again something that we've learned the hard way. It's so easy to do whiz bang stuff. And so easy to completely and utterly destroy the learning experience uh, by doing that, uh, which is why some of the, I've been involved in virtual reality stuff. And you know, if you got and people just don't cam it down, you know, so people are in for looking around and you know they're looking obsessively at that <laughs> that that texture, you know, not learning a damn thing. Over arousal is sometimes your enemy, but you have to get the right level of attention. So it's a matter of balance. So I, I thought it was important to, to tackle the attention thing and then really practical things like, should you play music while learning? You know, should you have music in the background of a video? Well, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> but I was just constantly seeing this stuff, you know, people laying down music tracks. You go, no, 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 no. We know a lot about this. Don't do it. Don't do the pings, the pongs, the claps. It, it's okay. And then it becomes really annoying, but it's actually destructive anyway. Not wholly. The interesting thing about the music one, as people say, is music when you're studying a good or a bad thing. What's quite interesting, there's no music is best, to be honest, uh, because it's always taking up some cognitive bandwidth. But music without lyrics is okay. And that has a, a, a marginal effect. Music without lyrics. As soon as you have lyrics in there, you're screwed, as it were. You know, that's it, you know, <laughs> the attention is taken by it. So as soon as I hear you know, a Penny Lane or Painted Black, I'm there, I'm, you know, that, I'm, my mind's gone, I'm not learning anything. So th there's some interesting just background research there. The usual stuff about being in the flow when you're learning, that's important, you know, to capture the mind, keep it going, keep it motivated. That's, that, that's what leads to good design. So that was really what that chapter was about. Very much research based. Yeah. Yes, very, yeah, very, very informative. So the, our next is the interface design. So tell us about that. Well, this is a really interesting area, and this is not my area of expertise. However, I think I've built so many of these systems now, uh, and the two big names here, of course, are Nielsen and Norman going back, and Krug. I've led, read quite a lot of the literature, and you can distill some essential messages here, Guy. One, one is use conventions. They all say this. Don't start reinventing the wheel, you know? We know what that little YouTube convention is for the control of video, use it, stick to it. Don't start redesigning the icons and becoming sort of Leonardo da Vinci on your interface. And a second big thing is keep it simple. It's just less is more every time. And we know from people like Mayer and so on about the clustering, the proximity of labels to the entity. You know, there's loads of detail in this. And Another important thing in interface design, which I think a lot of people are forgetting now, is that it's what happens now behind the scenes. So in my first book, which is about artificial intelligence and learning, I make a big deal of this because every single interface you do online now is mediated by AI. The most famous being the Netflix sort of interface. Of course, what you see in a tiled interface is determined by an algorithm. It's, and it draws on a deep set of data, which is aggregated from other people, but it knows about you personally. This is how interfaces are these days. So an interface designer, you know, this, I, I don't like this idea of an interface designer being some sort of graphics person who just makes it, tarps it up and makes it look good. If you don't know about what's being delivered, you're missing most of the equation. 
because it's actually about the efficacy and utilitarian purpose of the interface. That's what really matters. Good UX designers know this, of course. And then, of course, you have the disappearance of the interface. You know, I've got an A-L-E-X-A in the corner. I'm not going to say it or show spark off. But there is no interface there. I speak to it, you know. So the interface world is changing. And I wanted to give this idea that it's more complicated than you think. There's some basics you really need to know about using conventions, but it's getting complex. So that's what that chapter was about. Yes, and again, it's the less is more, and uh, don't yeah, you know exactly. force people to learn things unnecessarily just to be different. I, I thought that was uh, really key. Yeah, this chapter is on audio for learning, and you've uh, maybe touched on this just just lightly here previously, but uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, audio, of course, audio's really come of age, isn't it? Through this whole podcast thing, massively undervalued, I think, because. Again, let's keep this track going. This is great. Less is more. Why do I love podcasts? Well, uh, because actually the less is more principle applies there. I can actually, I'm not, I don't have the imagery or slides. And for abstract knowledge like philosophy or history or so on, I love them because my mind can reflect on the content. And then my faculty of imagination kicks in and I find I'm generative and learning more on a podcast than I would watching a video. And, we, and suddenly people are clocking onto this. The whole, you know, limited bandwidth and working memory thing is played out in the podcast world. And so I talk a lot about podcasts, but also the use of what not to do in audio, all the clap bings, mute playing music and so on. But it's, an, it's becoming an ever more important medium because uh, with increased bandwidth and streaming and so on, uh, the use of podcasts and mobile phones, of course, the A-L-E-X-A in every room and so on. Audio is becoming a much bigger deal in learning and people often just dismiss it. But it's wrong to dismiss it. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think po podcasts have really come in uh, like this huge hammer and said, listen, to, this is the way to go, guys. And to ignore it uh, would be a mistake. Of course, we, we missed a chapter there, didn't we, on text and graphics? So we can probably ju jump. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, that was a good way to do it, actually. The, the interesting thing about text and graphics, if we jump to that one, is I can read faster than I can listen. So you know, I'm sitting here with uh, I've thousands of books. You know, I'm a very bookish person because there's still that old adage that you know the user has to be in control here, and I can stop when I want and start when I want. The transience effect of audio and video can be dangerous. Uh, we can come to this when we discuss video maybe, but text is an incredibly powerful medium because once it's mastered that you go at your own pace, you can take notes, you can skip back. The book is a, one, you know, the book is a wonderful thing. I know where I am just by looking at the bottom, it's portable. It's a wonderful format, you know? Uh, and of course, writing was the big bang of learning theory. You know, that's when, the, that's when our species really took off because we had all that social capital that was archived, transmitted to other people on scale, and everything since then has been based. There's been a series of big bangs. We'll talk about that later in this third book I'm writing. But I think the ignore writing at your peril because it's a good thing. And, of course, graphics as well. Text and graphics, are in a sense, are co-joined. But you have to be careful with graphics. And, again, I'm seeing the same old mistakes that no doubt we saw years ago is, you know, what I call the uh, Lord Privy Seal problem. And the Lord Privy Seal, was a, it was a BBC film editor who taught me this. An old BBC film editor has got this course, which is, uh, if, if you mention Lord Privy Seal uh, in your text, you don't have a picture of a lord, a picture of a toilet, and a picture of a seal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and this, this, this habit learning designers have of just picking up on nouns on the right-hand side of the text and bunging up a illustrative issue, you know, or if it's a program of leadership, you just get lots of stock photos of oh, two perfect people in offices, you know, they all look beautiful, all the guys have got square jaws, all the beautiful, you know, beautiful coiffured uh, managers and so on. The real world is not like that, guys, you know. <laughs> and I think the danger there is that we start getting that posting stock imagery type stuff. And it, it tires me because I'd much rather just have the text, to be honest just the distraction. Nevertheless, diagrams, histograms are all a number of reasons why you should use imagery, because it can be incredibly powerful. But use it if it serves the purpose of your learning goals. Yes. That, I'm sorry that, uh, that I had jumped from to audio because I was really interested in the video, which is the next chapter. Yeah. I think your point here is that, you know, if you less is more and keeping it simple and a text will do it, 
And if you need to add a graphic or two, but don't go crazy with graphics and consider audio. And, and now, and now let's, let's talk about video here, video and animation. Yeah, this is, now video was really close to my heart because way back in the early days, I did a, we did a lot of video. It was a video company, actually. So I learned a lot about, you know, good, good learning, what's good and bad in learning video. I even made, well, made a feature film, believe it or not. Uh, so we, we made a feature film called The Killer Tongue, uh, which was a schlock horror movie. You can still see it, like, in the early hours of the morning on some weird streaming channel, you know. Uh, but I learned a lot, mainly about what not to do, because learning video is not entertainment. And the, we know the grammar of, Drama, especially, is great. You know, from uh, we we have you know a century of television and film. Of course, let's not ignore that. Uh, there's nothing worse than getting a freshly minted interactive designer to write the script for drama. It will just be so wooden. It's like a crate holding oranges. You know, like just don't do it. Get, writing dialogue for drama takes years. Uh, uh, you know, and some people can never master it. It's such a unique skill. But coming back to video, the, the basic thing I wanted to avoid here is the mistake that most people make. And I give a lot of talks just on video because it's the medium of the age. So the basic problem in the research is the transience effect. So it's a bit like a shooting star, you know, you're watching the video and you, and, but behind you, because you're going at the pace of the narrator and the visuals, you're not having time to stop and reflect or do any of that generative stuff like you are with podcasts. Uh, because your memory's burning up behind you. You know, it's like watching the shooting star come through the atmosphere. There's the tails burning up. But this is the danger. It gives you the illusion of learning. You think you're learning when you're not. So if you asked anybody what the second, you know, what was that box set you watched last month on Netflix? What was episode two? Nobody could tell you because <laughs> they've forgotten all. But I've just forgotten it all. And I give it, when I give talks, I give the famous exam, example of Rutger Heuer in Blade Runner when he's on the roof as the replicant, and it's my favorite scene in the history of cinema. Incredibly moving moment, and it, where he, he, saves, uh, he saves the guy and he pulls him up, and an act of amazing forgiveness, you know, because he's a robot, and this is a human who's been trying to kill him, and he saves his life, and he gives a little soliloquy, and it's Shakespearean, it's such a beautiful thing. Now, I remember that scene, I remember how I felt, but I can't remember what he said <laughs> for the life of me. Now, I, I have memorized it, so I could tell you about seeing the attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion, you know? And uh, the second line is, I've watched the uh, sea beams, sea beams glittering in the dark at the gates of Tannhauser, you know? And then it ends with time to die and he dies. It's incredibly moving uh, uh, scene. But nobody remembers the semantic stuff because video is not very good at knowledge. It just isn't, you know? There are other media that it's good for. And then things like chapterizing it, don't have the audio running over cuts, and video is never enough. That's my big message. You need to do something else with the video. So, you know, I've been involved in tools like Wildfire where you grab the transcript and then you use AI to take that transcript and then turn it into some meaningful, effortful learning, learner, you know, about the, the process that you're teaching or whatever. And it, let's say it's a video showing you process and there's six things. By the time you've seen step six on the video, you've forgotten what the first two were or what three and four were. But if you follow it up, it's actually quite good, the video, if it's showing you the physical manifestation of the process, let's say the use of uh, something on a factory floor or whatever, or a vehicle, but you need to follow up with something so they remember what the six, if, you, if they have to remember it, what do they have to walk away and remember? This is the end. What do they need to know? So we just finished one on driving, for example. You might think that's a bit weird. Well, why would you do that? Would you put them in a car? Well, they can't here because you have to do it in advance. But we, it, this was about defensive driving and how you drive trailers and so on. It's about having a, another person guide you. But where should they stand? Now, I have actually learned a lot. I don't, I've never driven a car in my life. That probably horrifies you as an American. It was unimaginable being an American, not driving. But I've never driven a car. But I feel like I feel as though I've learned a lot, nevertheless, about how I would, like reversing a trailer down a ramp with a boat on it, put your hands on the bottom of the wheel, turn left and right, don't have them on the top, because then it fits the, your mental model of turning left and right. You know, use your wing mirrors, don't lean over your shoulder, all this that stuff. But you do that by doing it after the video, reinforcing the learning because learning is a process, not an event. And then, of course, you've got to actually learn it by going into a car and doing it, of course. But it's a matter of getting that whole process in your mind. And so I'm a big fan of video, but it's never enough on its own. 
It has to be supplemented by other stuff and seen as part of a learning experience and an ongoing process. Ultimately, doing it in the workplace or is where you really have to get going with this. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Your chapter then, after that, number eight is engagement, questions, and feedback. Yeah, that's right, because as part of this notion of Effortful, you know, learning just the learner at some point has to make the effort to learn this stuff. And just watching stuff and listening to stuff is never enough, which is, and of course, the first big step is taking notes. Almost all good learners take notes. And it absolutely astonishes me when I give talks at conferences to 2,000 learning professionals and hardly anybody's taking notes. I, al I almost feel like walking out, I'm going, this is a hopeless cause. <laughs> and often, the, if people have seen me speak before, I often stand and say, listen, you're all good. let me tell you now, I've been invited to speak here for an hour, but you're gonna forget almost everything I'm, that I'm gonna about to tell you. You will forget it, unless you take notes <laughs> or record it or, or whatever. And you see people shuffling into their bag and looking a bit sheepish because they're not taking notes. And these are professional, I mean, these are people who teach in universities and so on, bizarre. But uh, the, the, the point about engagement is what does that word mean? You know, it's a bit of a vague word. And that's where you've got to be very, very careful about the detail. What does the psychology of learning tell us about actual engagement at, at that level? And engagement is the first thing that you've got to tackle and then what does the modern science tell us about retrieval practice, deliberate practice, interleaving space practice? It tells us a lot, but hardly anybody ever does it. But there's a good reason for that. It wasn't anybody's fault. Throughout most of our careers, we haven't had the technology to enable it. So, you know, you're, you're given a training course, but they walk out the door. How, how, how do you keep them going? Now we all have a smartphone. And that's a powerful personal device in our pockets. So you, you can get to people. And I think I was, I was just really keen to explain to people that there are, there's this huge array of methods of engagement which allow the learner to be cognitively engaged and make the effort to actually learn. Because learning always comes down to the individual learner at the end of the day. It's learners who learn. Teachers really just create the environment for motivation in a way, but ultimately the learner learns nothing without making the effort themselves. Now, retrieval practice is a good example of the one I, I normally use because, oh, you know, if you go into college or school and they'll tell the kids to take notes and then underline and highlight and reread, wrong. <laughs> Nothing. The, the, the psychology of learning screams at us again in the research. Carpicki almost brilliant on this. No, turn away from the page. Turn away and try and recall it in your brain because that act of recalling it, it, it will allow you to really deeply process the content. Think about it. And the act of recall is stronger than the original teaching event. So retrieval practice works like a dream. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've been chatting about uh, the early days of American history, and that's what I've been doing with that. You know, if I want to know, what do I need to know here? Well, I, I know that I need to know uh, yeah, that, you know, George Washington, uh, John Adams, uh, and then all that detail about jo Jefferson. I've got all that in my head, you know, and I can tell you then it was followed up by Madison Monroe and then John Quincy, uh, uh, John Quincy Adams, and on to Andrew Jackson, you know, because I've, I've made the effort to learn that stuff, you know, and that matters to me because that's the spine now upon which I can do a deeper dive into those first half dozen presidents and understand issues uh, that affect us even today, of course. So that was about effortful learning and how important open input is, you know, there's like we've got stuck in a rut with multiple choice question type stuff. And I think that's a real shame because we now have the technology that I've been using certainly to say, well, you know, if I said, you know, who's the key, who's the key figure in writing the Declaration of Independence? Who was a primary author? Uh, and, you know, I'm not too sure how many Americans would know that. I'm not an American, but I've, I've done the reading. But, you know, Jefferson is a huge figure here, a huge figure, because he had the intellectual capacity to learn from Paine uh, and other John Locke and all these theories. And uh, he also could write well. But there's a whole abolition. And so, you know, you can see where, where I'm going with this. The, the important thing is, I suppose that you asked me that question, I typed that in, that, some of those things would be right, but you now have AI software that would semantically interpret the answer. So why are we not using that sort of software as opposed to saying, you know, who is the main author of the Declaration of Independence? A, John Adams, B, <laughs> you know, and the answer's there on the screen anyway. If there's four options, 25% are getting it right. Am I really learning this stuff? I'm not so sure half the time that the you know thin, a thin sprinkling a lot multiple choice questions amongst a load of videos is of that much use to people 
Yeah, it's the whole notion of uh, recognition versus recall. Uh, you know, I think that's very, very well put in, in, in your book here. So chapter nine is about scenarios and simulations. What do you Yeah, think? I mean, there's a tendency, again, because we're obsessed by Bloom and that sort of, you know, like semantic knowledge and too much of it, you know, <laughs> like, like right, people in the real world don't have to carry a lot of carry entire textbooks around in their head. Nobody does, which is why nobody ever reads a manual when they get use a kit. Uh, nevertheless, when you're, when you're, people forget that, you know, we've had a lot of simulations. It goes back to war gaming, actually, you know, way back to the Prussians. There's a huge amount of simulation stuff and the military have always done this superbly well because you have to, because you die. <laughs> and interesting, the only other area that takes it incredibly seriously is in aviation. So, and this is my, a, a question I often put you, why, do, why are pilots obsessed by simulators? Because they go down with a plane. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, if you're going to die, you're going to do a simulation. And this is a real shame. I think it's why I think we should have more mini sims and sims in the world, you know, because it's much more effective in terms of transfer. We know this. All the research is clear. This is why pilots do 300 hours of simulation on a plane before they ever step on one. Uh, uh, so let's not beat about the bush there. We know we need them, but they're a bit expensive to build and so on, but they're getting a lot cheaper. And of course, we've got the whole VR world coming along that changes that landscape entirely. But my argument there is, I do a taxonomy of simulations. They're not one thing here. You can have some very basic, good scenario-based learning, which is like mini sims, really. Simulate what happens in the workplace here. What would you do in this situation? You have business sims where you go through, do loads of stuff, and then pull the lever at the end to see whether it's worked or not. There are different species of simulations here. So I, I try and cover that. That's why I put scenarios together with simulations there. It's something we know a lot about in this industry, the military, aviation, and, uh, you know, the rule also, you know, the, the whole notion of it's not all about the quality of the graphics. Focus on the learning. Uh, you know, it's psychological fidelity, not physical fidelity that matters here. Does it actually change your mind in such a way that you can actually perform this task? And so much, a lot of VR and that still, you know, wow, it looks great, you know, and all the money's been spent on these beautiful graphics. Actually, you probably didn't need that level of fidelity to achieve your goal. In the second, first and second world war, some of the early pilots were working in little cardboard boxes with levers and dials, you know, because they understood that it's the task that matters. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that sort of stuff, trying to just keep, keep what we've learned on the go here and pass it on. That's a nice segue into the uh, next chapter, 10, on VR and AR. Yes, well, I think with, you know, I had been heavily involved in VR and had all the early Oculus kits and demonstrated it literally hundreds and hundreds of people in Africa and all sorts of places. And I got slightly obsessed by it as a medium, and I, I still think there's something huge to emerge in this area. And then, of course, up pops the metaverse. And then, uh, so I've just finished a big, in my new book, I'm going to do a final chapter on the metaverse thing. Because I, I think people are dismissing the metaverse thing a bit early because if you've really taken a deep dive into VR and that whole immersion, complete overtaking of consciousness and its impact in terms of basic learning theory, so holding attention, complete attention, you can't help. There's no, you have no choice. You know, it's not as if you can drift off head back to the real world you're in there if you're doing a bungee jump you're screaming blue murder because you're there i i think transfer of learning that whole notion you know that we know a lot about context matters in other words if you want to create the context for learning that's going to be a good thing so i laid down the grounds about why this could be good for learning but comes back to the old things we know you know overstimulating people you can't use your hands you can't take notes there's all sorts of weirdness about vr that's still got to be solved but it will get there. So it was that distinguishing between good and bad practice in VR. I was keen to lay that down now. Uh, and then AR is something entirely different, of course. That's the, uh, the projection of something. But people often confuse them, but they're, they're, they're unrelated to each other in many ways, you know? But I think with the metaverse coming along, it, I'm gonna be writing quite a lot about this because I think we know a lot about what's coming anyway. And, the, and what will happen is people will say, oh, the metaverse, all, all learning is going to be in the metaverse. No, it will not. <laughs> we know already from VR that uh, <coughs> VR is good for very specific things. And those specific things are, do you need to manipulate objects in a 3D world or not? Do you have to be in a 3D world to learn this or not? Actually, a lot of 3D things you can learn in 2D. 
So take uh, if you take Labster, you know, the, as a software company, there's all the la uh, training on on labs, science labs. Actually, ninety percent of their sales are still two D, even though you can buy the VR kit, because actually you can actually learn how to read the calibration on a pipette on, in in two D. You know, we go to the movies and we get lost, suspension of disbelief, and we've been doing that for a hundred years. Uh, but they, you know, no, and three D television never took took off. Three D movies didn't take off. Because it's enough, you know? It's like the application of another principle here, which is Occam's razor, the minimum number of entities to reach your given goal. I think it's another good principle in learning. Minimum number of entities to reach your given goal. Then you'll not go overboard or over-engineer things. Good engineers know that principle inside out. <laughs> but learning theorists sometimes think, no, no, no. The most entities to your given goal is good. Screen packed with icons, you know, such a bells and whistles type stuff. So that, that's the VR and AR thing. Yeah, we're all fixated in, the, in this more, more and more and more. And if we can do it, maybe we should do it. And that's not necessarily true. And so I think yeah. that you're giving good guidance here in, in kind of holding people back, putting on the brakes from getting too enamored with these things. There is a, a time and a place for their use, yeah. but they're expensive. And so you really have to have a kind of a business case in order to you know, right. to some of some of these things. And if it's not really necessary, now it's good to experiment and learn, you know, how to do these things before you actually really, really need them. But you got to make a, you know, that's different than, than uh, applying these things to everything that comes your way just because you can. Um, it, it's you said something you of were, resources. You said something really interesting that the business case as well, and people forget about this, you know? So, if you're using VR, you know you're not you're not going to be doing online or streaming. Although you have you you do have web VR coming now, that that will happen. But you've also got to think about its integration. You know, and there are, there are 101 things that people don't think about in terms of cost. That you know you're not buying a 200 pound Oculus kit there. You're buying the professional kit with insurance that's going to cost double or triple that. Now, so people forget about the fiscal side of our project goes back to what is a learning designer really. You know, but some interesting things just to end on on the VR thing. Guy was. We're seeing now group, uh, multiplayer VR, so you're in with a group of people in that environment, and they can be anywhere in the world, of course. But the trainer can be an avatar in there with you, mediating the experience, or the trainer can be outside just doing VOIP, so voicing it, giving guidance. So I think this is, you know, this is why the multiverse is interesting. Suddenly, team training can be interesting. Or, you know, if you're on an oil rig and you have to get all because there's a fire, damn right you want to do that. You know, it can take you into dangerous places, sub-molecular places, out in space, places you're never going to be, or which are maybe just too expensive to get you there. And certainly simulate things that might be rare, like a fire on an oil rig. So there's loads of reasons why we should be using this. And of course, people involved in that sort of stuff have been using sims or anyway. But this will just make it cheaper and better. Yeah. Excellent. So your chapter 11 is on games and gamification. And of course, this yeah. is uh, huge for the last uh, several, couple of decades at least, uh, known by other names before that perhaps. But uh, so what's your guidance about games and gamification? Yeah, well, this is another area. Because I actually, when I was, uh, was chief executive, we were making games. I mean, proper computer games. And I was worked a lot in Los Angeles and, you know, the whole games industry thing. I know it quite well. And I have a lot of friends who work in that area who still do uh, and I just think it saddens me sometimes when I see the gamification or games and there are different things. The first thing that saddens me is the Pavlovian side of it. You know, let's, let's, have, let's have lots of little badges and scoring and whiz-bang type thing. And I, I sometimes I haven't done a lot of these. And I made a lot when I was younger. And I always used to avoid that stuff because what really mattered, if you're a real game player, so I have one son who is like, you know, like top 5% World of Warcraft type thing, you know, like been a game player all his life. And he laughs at most of the stuff. He said, <laughs> he finds a lot of educational games just bizarrely infantile because they don't pick up on the good things in games, which is leveling, respawning, the sort of skills-based stuff, you know, uh, keeping people in that zo learning zone so they don't go too quickly and fail too rapidly. The risk-reward ratios in games design is far more superior to most learning designers, I think. You know, they know a lot about this, the mathematics of it even. So... What I do in that chapter is say, well, because I'm not against games and learning at all. I'm just thinking there are the good and the bad here and the ugly. <laughs> and the ugly is just this obsessive gamification, uh, you know, Pavlovian 
scoring scores, collecting rubies and coins and badging. I just find it annoying. Uh, 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 but I think most of it's a Disneyfication of learning. I'm not, and of course, it takes up such a lot of bandwidth anyway that actually is killing the learning a lot of people. I don't think people understand that ratio. You have to leave lots of room for people to stay calm, digest, think, reflect, and learn. And if they're chasing a Pac-Man around the screen, they ain't going to be doing that. So there's a bad side, but there's a good side. And the good side is this leveling. There are some motivational features around gaming that are really very powerful indeed. So it's a matter of balance there. Uh, that's what that chapter was about. Chapter 12 is on social learning. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a huge area here. And, you know, the, uh, my friend Julian Stodd, who lives and breathes this, calls this the social age. And we have a lot of arguments about this because I, I don't think, I think it's the age of AI, not the social age. You know, I think, I know that I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not so convinced that I've got a thousand books because, because they're social entities. <laughs> and I'm glad you've got books behind you as well. I think the danger is in thinking that everything should be social. So again, it was a bit like games. Be very careful with just using, slamming that adjective social in the front of something and think that's great learning. Actually, there's a lot of evidence to show that in groups, you get a lot of social loafing. You know, people are in a group, but there's always, you get five people or two doing nothing. So I checked out while the extrovert takes over. You get that a lot in that old, you know, classroom training, you know, sit around those round tables and you get the, felt tip pens and the, you know, the, the sweets in the middle and then the extrovert takes over and stands up and becomes a chair and feeds back. And, you know, there's a lot of bad practice in social learning. Nevertheless, social media has shown how powerful this is. I think Julian, my friend, has a good, he's right on this. You know, we do live in that sort of social age where the technology has enabled it and we can certainly exploit it in a way we never have before. And I pushed the boat out there about, you know, how it can be used generatively uh, for retrieval practice and all sorts of things. So, you know, on Twitter, I'm, you know, we, we use those social tools and I learn a lot from social media. Uh, uh, you know, I often come across, you know, uh, we've never met in person before. Although I, I, suddenly I reflect on that. I feel I know you quite well, but we've never <laughs> met. <laughs> but we know each other quite well because we have constant uh, uh, awareness and dialogue on social media. And I think we're starting to learn a lot about how powerful that actually is. Even in terms of space practice, I was talking about this yesterday, this notion that because you tweet something is a form of space practice or reinforcement, if you're, or you write a blog or you write a book, this is all the reinforcement of certain knowledge into your brain so that you eventually have it. So I'm speaking quite freely about this book because I wrote it, but I've been writing about these things for years. So they're in my mind, you know, and, you know, and uh, that's what the acquisition of expertise is about really. So the social stuff, again, it's a bit like gamification, good and bad. How do you run? Like there are very formal social things that I think are quite good, which COVID has thrown up. But people tend to be, you know, right in the middle and just blasting out lectures on Zoom and say, no, 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 we know a lot about how this works. You've really got to sit to the side and let that network develop and discuss things amongst themselves. But you've still got to be incredibly structured. You've got to have learning goals or it's just all over the place. So I try and pluck out all the good practice in the literature there about social learning through that webinar type thing, the asynchronous side of it, also the synchronous side, and gives people hints and tips, some do's and don'ts there because there's a huge number of people doing that now, but I think they're doing it quite badly. That's not to blame anybody. They've just not had any experience in it before, many of them. So that was quite an important chapter, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, this is all good stuff. So this brings us to chapter 13 on transfer and practice. Yeah, I, I mean... What do you say? You know, how, it's the old, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> and we know, if you've been around long enough, this just grows on you. You know, you just don't learn anything without, without practice. And that doesn't mean repetition. There are sophisticated forms of deliberate practice, deliberate difficulty, retrieval practice, space practice. Uh, you know, lots of variations on the theme here. But the theory underpinning this, of course, is just transfer, I think. You know, you're not going to get anywhere with, on the transfer kick. And I talk a lot in this chapter about transfer, you know, what is the theory here? And we've had really good theory, especially recently about the different dimensions in transfer. And uh, I've, I've just been building a bit of software uh, for a client, actually, with my, uh, you know, with, with Calum, uh, it's a piece of AI software that actually does this for you. 
so what it does is takes you know some of the stuff that you would be you know inside out about dimensions of the learner you know data points inputs what, what kind of learners have you got where are they and so on things about the learning and sort of taxonomy stuff what type of learning is this and then also what resources have you got what are your constraints like budget <laughs> and then it takes all those inputs there's some very clever maths in the middle but it also has built into the model the 10 different dimensions or variables on transfer so it comes it optimizes the blended learning solution based on the research and transfer yeah. Now, I think this is the way all the, this will go, you know, because most people, when they design a learning solution, you can go through a process, but you probably missed out six. Oh, I never thought about VR or Sims game. You know, you, you do what you've done before or what's just in your mind. But I think we should get more serious in the software we use here. And on in this area on transfer and practice, I just wanted to expose people to the power of retrieval and space practice, that long tail of learning. Again, learning is a process going back to my premise because not many people understand that it's a massive multiplier. It's not trivial. It's really what makes it work in the workplace is going and getting it done. So you have to have all these organizational things about is the organization context set up to take you and to do this when you get back there. These are supervisors know about this, but there's also is the training, you know, does the training have these hooks in to make you want to go and apply it in the real world? And then also the personal motivation. Do you have you thought about this? Have you thought about transfer when you get back to the ranch? You know, people turn up at conferences all the time. They don't take notes, and then they go back and wonder why it was a waste of time because they they forgot it all. Now I've, I'm in the habit of going to a, a conference, and when I used to do this and ran a big company, I would blog the hell out of the thing for for the employees when I got back because I wasn't there for myself. I was there as a representation of the organisation. And so, you know, and that's the transfer of learning. I learned a lot by simply writing it up, picking out the things I'd learned, and then I get it to whoever needs to get it to. So I think you get the idea there, I think, generally. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I think it's the, the key point there is that it needs to be kind of deliberate and it needs to be thought of. It can't be an afterthought because you might design differently based on the, what the transfer situation exactly. would be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this, this, software gives, this software interestingly gives you like a transfer rating so when it optimizes the blend you can play around with the budget so you might say well I've only got $30,000 but your transfer score is likely to come down then you know but to, realistically so you can play around with the model to, to get what's mm -hmm. right for you given the balance of all those forces and you can only do that mathematically you can't do it in your head you know right yeah too many, too many variables and, and if correct. you impact the return Maybe it's will, you're willing to spend a little bit more on the investment side to get a bigger return because if you don't do the investment, you'll get zero or nil return. And what good is that? Exactly. So your your final chapter then is on workflow curation and data. Yeah. Well, this is of course the the first book I wrote was on AI for learning, and we had another phenomenon that's unrelated to this really, which is. We've lived with a learning management system and SCORM world for 20, 30 years, and we know how constraining this is. It's not a data-driven model, and uh, these are repositories of stuff, and it's about the management and timetabling of it, and not really the delivery of the stuff. So they tend to be like dark dungeons, you know? Users don't like them much, they get stuck in them, wonder why, why they're there, and the L&D get frustrated because they don't do what they want. But I think we're, we're finally crawling out of that dungeon with the LXP type technology, which is a more focus on the workplace and performance and workflow. And we, of course, have, no, have been fascinated by this for a long time, going back to people like yourselves and your mentors, you write a lot about, about this a lot. And I'm on absolutely in the same rail track as you in this one, because it's not as though this is new, this goes back to the 1970s and so. And then I, people like yourself have written extensively about, about it, as of Marsic, Jay Cross, you know, loads of theorists have come up with this, but we've never been able to, to get it delivered. But the technology has finally come along, the learning experience platforms that personalize delivery to your stuff you need at that moment, you know, Bob Mosher's five moments of need, uh, uh, the curation of learning. So when you get stuck and you're in the workflow, because people learn by doing anyway, I think L&D often forgets the fact, you know, this goes back to Tolman 1930s paper and, and you're just on rats even. Actually, by just doing stuff, you learn a pile in the workplace. Always remember that because sometimes you don't need to do the training. Sometimes it's already just change the process uh, or improve the process. 
But if you're stuck, the first thing most people do is go to a search button. <laughs> but you have to be able to search properly. You have to be able to go in. It's not like Google search or searching on YouTube. That's good. You need to have that. What a wonderful boon that's been. But you also need to search your own stuff. It has to be able to search inside your videos, your PowerPoints, your documents in your own organization. That's a different kettle of fish. And you need to have really sophisticated AWS type search functions and to search inside a video, for example. But that's here now. And so you have a number of vendors who are selling the, uh, the learning experience. But you're not getting rid of the LMS because you still have some formal courses. I think... You know, the LMS people are pushing towards being learning experience platforms and the learning experience platform people are pushing back towards being a bit of an LMS as well because you need some of that formal training. We know that as well as the on the hoof learning the workflow stuff. It's not an either or, it's both. So that final chapter was all about how you design for this new world because you're not, you're not necessarily delivering these full milk courses that you know, last hours and hours. You're delivering job aids, checklists, FAQs, you know, all sorts of things that you may never have thought of before. Resources rather than courses in many ways. And I know that you are huge on this and recommend any of you watching this to, to read your books on it because you, you've nailed all of this for many, many years. But it's important that we understand that this new world, it's actually the old world, we're just realizing it now. <laughs> and the curation of content, all those new things that the technology is helping us do with relative ease now. It's such a wonderful thing to see this finally happen and for, for the learning world to get real because we've got this congruence between good theory and good tech. At the, in the past, it's been nobody's fault. This, the technology emerged out of the sort of client server software in the 90s. The internet comes along, but we continue just with the HTML flat stuff. Uh, we're still stuck in really the multiple choice questions plus that. We're still in HTML type presentation mode in e-learning. But that's actually not effortful learning. You have to come around the other side of that and say what enables really smart stuff. We need smart software that personalizes it. And that's what this new world is, which is why I, I finished on that chapter. I, it's called Learning Experience Design. But this is really what this is about. Uh, I hope that made sense. <laughs> no, it, it does. I, I've, I've been saying for a while now that the, really the only thing that's really changed from my perspective in this field over the past 40 years is the technology that enables us to do our work and the technology that enables us to distribute, to make it accessible, to push or, or enable pull. Um, but, the, but the basic principles have been established for a long time. They're not well known. They're not universally uh, applied, but but it's always been there. And so, yeah. hopefully, as technology makes things actually easier for us, I think we can apply more of a of a scientific disciplined approach to the the analysis, design, and development of content and help implement it, help it transfer. Um, and continue the, you know, because if the job itself is not going to reinforce what you've learned, we need space learning. We need all of this here. And the technology has just made it available. So part of the reason it's not well known is because we weren't able to really do it. We weren't able to right. implement these things without tremendous expense. And the organizations that we work for weren't willing to step up to that. But now it's affordable. And I really liked what you what you've done in this book here because I think you've made this. You've addressed all the key issues in this book in, in such a accessible manner that I think that this holds a lot of promise for helping our profession become more professional and have greater impact to our clients and and what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um. So, so you, you, you kind of mentioned this, I think, a little bit, but you're working on a new book here, and you just recently started it, if I, if I remember what I've seen on social media. So yeah. what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I've given myself a, another rod for my back. I know you're a book writer, so you, you say yes to writing these books, and minutes later you go, what have I done? Because <laughs> you know how much your life is going to be spent sitting on the keyboard. But then, and of course, it coincides with coming out of COVID, which is a shame because maybe I've less time than I thought I had. Nevertheless, this book's quite different. It's something I wanted to do for a long time, which is, you know, I'm, I'm really a learning technology person by background. That's my main area of interest and expertise in business and in theory. 
And I think people get the learning technology thing all wrong. You know, they think it was just, it's just the recent stuff, you know, it's just computers. Forgetting the fact that learning technology has been around as long as we as a species have been around, you know, from Homo habilis, handyman. Uh, and so I, I did a lot of reading on that early stuff. You know, you even go back to the, the big cognitive explosion 45,000 years ago. I had been in the Altamira Caves and seen those uh, drawings of, it is an astonishing experience going in with a, a torch, you know? And uh, I never believed that the shamanistic 1960s interpreters, that they were all going in there and taking drugs or whatever. I, I just never bought that. Actually, all the recent research shows that it, it was a social space for these, because they were hunter-gatherers then. There was no farming. They would come together and it was a learning experience. They were a little, a little bit like simulators. The, the recent research is fascinating on this. So they've unpacked the drawings now because you, would, you view them by flickering candlelight or, or, you know, or, or torchlight. And they've actually shown that what is actually represented are all the animals that you need to kill or are going to kill you. So it's a predator prey, like, you know, simu flight simulator in many ways. But I, and I also go back to that, early, you know, the earliest technology we have is stone axes and our, for millions of years, we have very early stuff, but loads of experimental psychology showing you cannot make one of those axes without having language and teaching and learning. You just cannot. And even something like fire, fire is a technology. Fire is a technology because it extended the amount of time. It, it created a hearth around which people sat. So you got the whole storytelling narrative thing going across generational stuff. It extends the time you're awake into nighttime where you're not doing anything else but learning in a way. So there are all sorts of aspects of fire. Also cooking, you know, that whole notion of being able to have more time to do other stuff. So our species, in a sense, is all, always in evolutionary terms depended upon the advancement of learning. We are the teaching and learning species. Homo sapiens, knowing man. You know, that's what we are as a species. We're the only species that teaches and learns in a cultural transmission. But of course, I go through the whole gamut of this stuff. That's a small part at the beginning. I'm very keen to show that underlying all technology is learning technology. We don't have steam engines, cars, without having pens and pencils. <laughs> you know, we really don't, or paper. So writing is the big bang. But writing is quite a complicated. It only have happened in four places on the earth, in China, Mesoamerica, Middle East, and Egypt. And, and actually, the, the, it sort of got crushed in, uh, in uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, but these are the other places where civilization took place. Writing created everything else. Mesoamerica, especially the first farming, spreads out the rest of the world. So we've got pens, pencils, and the pencil is a wonderful thing, isn't it? You, you know, you forget... Do I have a pencil? I don't have a pencil handy. But, you know, it has an eraser on the end for writing out mistakes. You get that whole notion of correcting. Uh, it's a beautiful little object, portable. You know, it sort of self-writes itself. If you go down, you sharpen it. Oh, such a wonderful things about it. We forget how marvelous these technologies are. And then you come into printing and you get this multiplication effect on through books, of course textbooks especially, you get the rise of mass schooling on the back of the Reformation and printing. And then we come into broadcast media. People forget that, you know, this is all learning technology. When I went to school, we had a television in the, in the classroom. You know, we used television. Before that, people used radio. The guy, you know, uh, uh, Dougie Mass, the guy who invented uh, a, a Moodle, I know him. He actually learned through shortwave radio and getting books dropped for an airplane because he lived in the outback in Western Australia. We forget that all of this is technology, but the premise behind the book is this idea that learning technology is more fundamental than other forms of technology. It's what's enabled all the other technologies to be invented. You don't have a Nikola Tesla uh, 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 or anyone else or an Elon Musk without having that learning sub-belly, as it were, you know, underbelly to it all. And then uh, right through, I, I do the, I'm doing the whole computer type revolution that we lived through. What a time to live, you know, what I worked in the first Apple, first PCs, all that stuff. And then we come into the internet, of course, around 2000. Wow, it's like a Cambrian explosion, you know, of learning opportunities. And we all do online learning. I mean, we're sitting here talking from one side of the planet to another, barely aware of, and we don't think twice about it. But I, when I was nine years old and people told me this was possible, it would have blown my mind. And I remember watching Star Trek where they all had the little, you know, flip up things. And they could speak to each other and go, I did, that actually happened, you know, <laughs> in our lifetime. And then, of course, you move 
beyond the internet into VR, and then I'm, I'm going to discuss all the artificial intelligence stuff that I know about, and into the multiverse, and I'll, I'll end on that one. So it's this broad sweep of learning technology, learning technology being fundamental to all other forms of cultural transmission, and the fundamental thing in civilization. Look, I don't think anybody's written a book like, there are lots of books in technology I've read, but they, they treat it almost as a mechanical, mechanical objects instrumentalize it. So it's a sort of reductionist view of technology. This is technology with a hyphen, an ology of technology, you know, it's like geology, the science of technology but very particularly learning technology. Because I do believe what I've said there is true, that without the invention of writing, all the tech, and writing is literally tech. You have to do something onto something, and then the things you do on then get multiplied through printing or manuscripts or books. Uh, and then that, in a sense, gets scaled up through computers and the internet and so on and so forth. I hope that made we sense. We expect this book to come out. Okay, well, I'll have it written by J July, uh, so it's quite quite quick. And I'm not sure what the publisher's date after that is. You know, it's publishers publishers work on uh, on another time zone from the rest of the world. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, you write a book and then you you hang around for a couple of months. Well, well, it's published. Whereas whereas the rest of the world, you know, you'd, you'd have it out there quickly. But to be fair, they've got to get printed and so on. But, uh, uh, but it I will be this year. It will be this year definitely. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. So hopefully we can do a third video about <laughs> your books and you can share, uh, you know, I try to give you a little space here and get out all the bigger venues here because my audience isn't so large, but I do really appreciate you spending the time with me to help get the word out because, you know, I think this can be extremely impactful to our profession uh, and help people do a better job and, you know, do get more by, by doing less. Yeah. Donald, thanks so much for sitting down here with me to talk about learning experience design, sharing your wisdom and insights and, and overhanging the market a little bit about this next book. Um, and for your many, many contributions, your, your blog posts, uh, the videos that uh, I've seen you, that, of you uh, doing uh, 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 keynotes and other uh, sessions uh, at different conferences and that, and for this podcast series that you're doing with John Helmer. I, I, I very much appreciate that, and I always look forward to seeing these. But thanks again so much for your time today. You have a great day. Yeah, and thank you. And I know you do the same. You know, I reciprocate that because you're one of these guys who share stuff, which is, I think, and a lot of people benefit from that. But I think it's up to us, uh, Right, veterans to, to 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 do that in many ways. So no, thanks for the opportunities. It's been great as usual, Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye.